We're gonna go over whether or not lifting stunts growth in younger athletes, and we're gonna start right now. So the common thought is that lifting stunts growth in, in youth athletes, especially prepubescent athletes. So we're talking about females prior to the age of 11, 12 would be a later period when they would actually hit puberty for men again, 11, 12, 12 years old, 13 years old. So the common thought is that if they start to weight train or resistance train prior to that age, they're going to have their growth stunted. And so that's actually a pretty common thought. Here at the gym, we have a lot of parents that come in and that's, that's a concern that they bring up and they'll say, oh, we just got out of COVID, or we're getting out of COVID and my, my child has been pretty sedentary, but I'm a little concerned that if they get into weight training, that it's gonna stunt their growth, that they won't be as tall as me or my wife. Whatever that genetic makeup will be, they're concerned that there's going to be an hindrance on their growth because of strength training because of resistance-based training. And so a lot of this stems from research in the past. And so what I decided to do was go over strength training in children and adolescents. One study from Catherine Dehab, and then another meta-analysis on resistance-based training for children and adolescents from Western Michigan University. And this was done under the viewpoint from uh, Allison Myers. And so I broke these down and I'm sitting here and I wanted to understand, especially myself as a father who has four children, one who's 10 years old already, and my second son, six, he turned seven in a couple months. And so this age is when they're starting to be much more active. They're starting to partake in more sports. They're playing a bunch of different sports and they're learning those important motor skills. And so I think the first step that we have to do is when we break down these studies is realize where does this concept stem from, right? Where does the thought of growth being stunted stem from? What most people are referring to as far as medicine is concerned is the Salter Harris epiphyseal growth plate fracture. This growth plate fracture could in theory, if we have an individual who let's say they fall and they break their growth plate in their wrists or, or wherever these are located throughout the body, they get a stress fracture and it hinders that growth plate from actually opening up and assisting in the growth of that specific limb. And then one limb might end up being shorter than the other. And that's one of those big theories here is that there's gonna be a growth plate fracture. Another area of this problem is that a lot of parents will come in and say, well, if my kids under load, if they're doing a squat or they're doing a bench press, that they actually think that's gonna like compress the individual and that's gonna to lead to them being shorter. I've actually had gymnastics athletes tell me this because that's what apparently a lot of people also believe that about gymnasts, is that they always end up shorter than they otherwise would have been genetically. Ignoring the fact that just smaller gymnasts tend to be better and there's a lot of people who get into gymnastics that get out of it because they get too big. Those are the main areas of where it comes from. And then finally, I think a lot of this stuff stems from the National Electronic Injury Surveillance System created, I believe, by the NIH in the 70s and 80s to monitor injuries. And so what they actually reported around strength training and resistance-based training with prepubescent individuals was that there was two deaths in the 70s and the 80s of like a nine-year-old and an 11-year-old. And these two individuals, one of them was at home and a bar fell on his chest and sadly he passed away. And then another one, almost the exact same thing happened. And I think he was actually also bench pressing and got stuck at the bottom. And as that compressed his chest, he ended up having like a heart attack, something along these lines. And he also sadly passed away. So this is a horrible, tragic events. The National Electronic Injury Surveillance System was trying to bring in all this information from all these different sports. So when this information was reported globally, that led to this sort of fear around resistance based training or strength training. And so the first thing that I wanted to do after establishing where does this stem from, right? Where, what are the thought processes around this? What about children's sports and the prevalence of injury within those sports and then also, do we see globally in these research papers that there's more injuries and the Salter-Harris epiphyseal growth plate fracture? Does this happen? Is this actually founded in the research? And so the first thing that Myers points out is that youth athletes, prepubescent athletes, if we can think about when we watch a younger individual squat or even bench press, they sort of bench press with dumbbells and they're, they're all over the place. Or they squat down and they do a jump and when they land, their knees shake and they buckle. And that's all related to 
coordination, 100% coordination. It's the same reason why when you watch youth athletes, if they're playing ice hockey, they tend to be drastically slower, much more hesitant. They're not as coordinated. They don't have the muscle mass. They don't have the motor control yet. Some of these injuries that we end up seeing in other sports, soccer or baseball or basketball or football, tend to be related to the lack of ability to execute a stretch shortening cycle. So a stretch shortening cycle would be when someone drops, they jump up for a pass and they land and then they jump back up, that stretch shortening cycle is a very rapid contraction. So very rapid use of energy to get back up and jump again. And because we have youth athletes that haven't developed, they lack that coordination, they lack that skill, they lack that the co-contractions that may need to happen, and so that leads to injuries, sometimes catastrophic, like an ACL tear. What we find it, from Meyer's research is that when they looked at resistance-based training, there was 0 0.035 injuries in resistance-based training per 100 hours. 0 0.035 injuries per 100 hours. That's for resistance-based training and strength-based training. Now, if we look at rugby or football or soccer, the injury rate was 0.8 per 100 hours. So substantially, like drastically, much more injuries are prevalent in sports like rugby, soccer, lacrosse, football in relation to resistance-based training. Based off of research and meta-analysis from a peer-reviewed journal, there is substantially fewer injuries during resistance-based training. So as far as the correlation to the Salter-Harris stress fracture, we can immediately say, okay, well, if there's only 0.035 injuries per 100 hours in participation in the resistance-based training, the likelihood of that, there being a, a stress fracture or anything like that is very, very minimal. Whereas in comparison to a football, lacrosse, rugby, uh, wrestling, soccer, those injuries are almost at one per 100 hours. And so they're a little bit higher. So the risk is definitely favoring uh, resistance-based training. So now what does resistance-based training provide youth athletes? What can it do for youth athletes if we're executing resistance-based training properly? If we look at, especially coming out of COVID, a lot of kids struggled with self-esteem, with weight gain, with just having healthy habits. And so what Myers found is that individuals that were prepubescent tended to actually have greater levels of self-esteem. They had greater self-image because they were confident in what they had done in the weight room. They had seen some transformation as far as their body was concerned. And they also found that these same individuals, if they strength trained for over six months, started to have healthier habits long-term that transferred over into the remainder of their life. So now they are learning these healthy habits around nutrition. They're learning these healthy habits around actually exercising. And then on top of that, what they started to see is that because the most important adaptations that occur early on in resistance-based training tend to be based around motor control. So all at the same time, they become more coordinated. They learn how to co-contract in those joints that are unstable. And so they actually have a much lower level of injury rate which in turn enhances their performance in these various sports that they might be playing, you know, four or five different sports that some of these kids play. And so that led to an even greater increase in their self-esteem. They really harped on in this study from Myers is that overweight individuals might have otherwise in the past felt beaten down, felt like failures. I was an overweight kid. I weighed 155 pounds when I was in fifth grade. So I was a very large kid, but I would do sports like swimming, football, wrestling. And one of the things that I personally struggled with was I had terrible cardio, like horrible cardio because I was so overweight. So what they saw now is that these athletes or individuals that tend to be more overweight when they're in their adolescence, did much better with actual resistance-based exercise versus doing cardio or aerobic-based exercise because they were more confident in it. They weren't feeling beaten down and just constant failures. And so now we can get into, there has to be some risk behind resistance-based training. So what are those actual risks? And then how can we apply this to raising adolescents that they can actually uh, partake in strength training and, and use resistance-based training to improve their coordination and improve their overall health. And so that first big risk that Myers points out is that a very large population of, of individuals that partake in strength training 
tend to have lumbar injuries, so lower back injuries. And so I'm reading the line right here, you know, that I had had highlighted where it's one study reports trunk injuries being approximately 36% of the injuries reported for men and 27% for women. Other studies of young athletes note high rates of lumbar spine pain. One study noted that 29 of 43 adolescents at some point had a lower back injury. And I think the knee jerk reaction is, oh my gosh, we shouldn't do resistance based training because you're probably going to hurt your back at some point. The sad part here is that basically everybody has lower back pain at some point. We're sitting all day. We have kids in schools sitting all day. So their hamstrings get shortened, their glutes start to shut off. They have terrible posture. They're on their phones. And so now we're going to tell them not to resistance based train which could actually improve the functionality of their trunk. And so I think that's a really important thing is that one of those risks is lower back issues can arise. So we have to be aware of that when we're training individuals, we have to warm them up properly. We have to teach them the technique accordingly. And if we teach them the technique accordingly, according to Myers, we see a massive decrease in their risk to having a lumbar injury. And so it comes down to teaching and educating them with technique and proper movement pattern and, and harping on these individuals, on these youth athletes, because they're younger, they're not as mature. They need to be more aware of how they're actually training. So they need more instruction from the coaches. As they're training, what's actually happening physiologically? Because if they're not having these Salter-Harris epiphyseal growth plate fractures, if that's not happening, what's actually occurring? What's the adaptation that's occurring? And so let's go into the, the actual morphological adaptations that happen. Allowing a faster transfer of force from muscle contraction to bone movement via the tendon leads to an increase in tendon stiffness, causing a decrease in EMD as has been uh, demonstrated. And so what happens is as they start to become more coordinated and as they're going through these motor skill acquisition periods, their fascicle length starts to get a little bit longer. They can then put out a little bit more power. They're more coordinated. And over time, their muscles start to grow, which leads to all of their joint capsules now become more stable. They see an improvement in tendon stiffness and they see an improvement in bone content related to resistance-based training. The muscles start to get a little bit bigger, the motor skill acquisition is improved, and now we see bone density improving. And now, after that bone density starts to improve, resistance-based training regimens have demonstrated decreased rates of fracture, musculotendinous and muscle injuries associated with sports-specific practice and competition. So they found actually the total opposite from growth plate fractures, Instead, they found that these individuals that were, were taking on resistance-based training at a younger age had a decreased rate in fractures. They had a greater level of bone density, so they had less breaks. And because they're more coordinated, there was a drastic drop-off in catastrophic injury. And so this takes us back full circle to the beginning. You know, the, the entire discussion is based around growth plate fractures, and the two deaths that were reported by the National Electronic uh, Injury Surveillance System, which I still just think is a, a crazy system that they had in the 70s and 80s. It was like a, an injury system to fight the Cold War. What does this mean for application? That, you know, We know that there's a risk in training youth athletes to having injuries. We also know, based off of Myers, that there was still evidence that people were pushing kids to one rep maxes, and as long as they were experienced, they could still actually have a one rep max in certain lifts and not get injured. Now, I'm not saying that that should be happening. What I'm saying is that as we have athletes come into the gym and as we have athletes and in, in individuals that have been more sedentary over the last two to three years, shying away from resistance-based training tends to be the absolute worst thing that I think that they can do. I think that when these individuals come into a gym or they come in to work out and they're starting to exercise, we have to think about, are they doing other sports that put them at greater risk of injury? In most cases, absolutely, their actual sports of basketball, football, baseball, have a much greater injury rate than resistance-based training. So that needs to be addressed first. The second thing is that we have to understand 
that we need to spend time with these individuals as coaches and really coach them up on their movement pattern, coach them up on our expectations, and then also educate them on their nutrition. And especially if this individual or, or younger athlete tends to be more overweight, we need to really push them to take on weightlifting and to stay in the world of weightlifting for as long as possible because then later on we'll see an improvement in their overall health. So understanding this moving forward means that technique's imperative, positive support is imperative, weightlifting indeed does not stunt growth but in fact based off of research does the opposite and can improve bone density, can improve the joint integrity and there's some discussion that even when individuals start to lift weights, they actually have an increase in growth hormone. And in the past, I've even heard some coaches mention that it might even stimulate some growth because the growth hormone starts to trigger a little bit earlier. The fact of the matter comes back to improvement of overall health, improvement of their execution of the movements, recognizing there's a risk of lower back injuries. And so we have to slowly bring these kids up to speed on how to move effectively influence them with positive nutrition choices, and then finally recognize that there's going to be a decrease in injury which will not hinder their growth long-term as long as the sessions are applied effectively. So if you're an individual who has you know, kids that wanna get into weight training, you're a coach that wants to get more kids into weight training, into resistance-based training, we have an entire program uh, based around children's strength training that you can do in-house, at your home, in your basement, where you can start with body weight exercises and slowly build up to more complex movements over the span of the entire program. You can click on the link down below, head over to garagestrength.com, pick up that program today to make sure that your athletes, that your children are healthy, they're getting stronger, they're in a better mindset as they continue to age long-term. And remember, with youth-aged athletes, we always have to influence them to cultivate their power. Peace.